Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, I'm going to address the question of what if I had millions of dollars to give away to researchers in the field of parapsychology? How would I prioritize things? Let me begin by saying I'm not an active researcher myself. Almost all of my waking time goes into the New Thinking Aloud video channel. I don't have a million dollars or many millions, which is really what would be required, nor am I seeking those funds. But I think it's an interesting question to ask. Suppose somebody just handed me a few, a budget of, let's say, a few million dollars every year to invest in parapsychology. The truth is, I do know what my priority would be. And I'm going to explain it to you now. It begins, I think, with uh, the story of uh, Hippolyte Leon Denizard Revail, who was born, as I recall, in 1804 and died in 1869. You probably don't know who that is. However, he's well known under his pen name of Alan Kardec. He was a uh, professor of pedagogy, I believe, in uh, France, in Paris. And uh, he actually is the founder of uh, a religious movement known as Spiritism. He wrote many books. The Spirit's Book is probably his most famous book. But he developed a protocol which is of great interest. And uh, he began working with spirit mediums, which were very popular during his own lifetime in the mid 19th century. And uh, he had a method. It was really rather simple. He got mediums uh, to consult with him and he would ask them different questions. And he simply uh, suggested that if all seven, if he, had, I think he had seven mediums, maybe more. But when, if, if I recall correctly, when seven mediums would agree on a particular answer to a particular question or came into rough agreement, he ascribed uh, that to uh, a level of certainty, of confidence that what they were saying was accurate. And using that methodology, he mapped out uh, what goes on in the spirit world, at least to the best of his ability. And it was so successful and so popular that his books are in publication today, uh, 150 years after his death. So, uh, you have to understand he founded a new religion, but he didn't approach it as a religion. He approached it as a um, scholarly project using a uh, method, a method of inquiry. Now, people will argue, was his method scientific? And many people will say, no, it wasn't because there was no empirical verification it, the verification was based only on consensus. And yet today, uh, we're in a position where we have uh, empirical evidence that wasn't available in Kardec's time. We have, for example, the database at the University of Virginia where uh, they've been studying cases of the reincarnation type where young children report reincarnation memories. That database has over 2,500 instances in it, and I'm pretty sure that uh, more than half of them have actually been verified in the sense that researchers were able to uh, collect information from these young children and uh, track down the details of the ostensible past life. So, so with a lot of information of an empirical nature about that that wasn't available in Kardec's lifetime or Reveal's lifetime, if we use his actual name. Now, in addition, I have to say to um, the methodology used by Reveal, we have 
great refinements that have been made to that methodological procedure. And now I'm referring to the uh, remote viewing consensus protocol or uh, the Mobius consensus protocol developed by my friend Stefan Schwartz who got teams of remote viewers together on a number of projects, mostly in the field of archaeology. There are uh, any number of interviews about this now in our archive. I can't link to all of them because there are so many. But what I do suggest is that you, for those viewers who don't understand about our listings, I will link to that right now, the listings page on New Thinking Aloud, where every single interview uh, is listed and linked to on our listing page. And you'll see uh, a number of interviews by Stephanie Schwartz in which he describes in detail how that protocol works, the great care that he took to make sure that it was scientifically reliable and accurate, and the results that he obtained in areas such as archaeology were very, very impressive. Now, I think the goal ought to be to consider, let's call it the Bardo Plains, the afterlife, the super sensible realm as like an undiscovered continent. I mean, it's not totally undiscovered because we have uh, explorations by mystics and psychics and religious figures going back uh, millennia, as a matter of fact. But uh, Reveil or, or Kardec, as he is more popularly known, uh, really did the very first systematic evaluation of what this new continent is like. What is it all about? And, you know, it wasn't all that expensive. He had many sessions with mediums. I imagine he invested quite a bit of his money uh, paying them for their time. If he, he didn't, uh, perhaps they donated their time. This research doesn't have to be terribly expensive. But in addition to the uh, methodology initiated by Kardec and the protocols refined in particular by the work of Stefan Schwartz, we have other modalities besides mediumship to consider. And, and the most obvious being the one utilized by Schwartz himself, that of remote viewing. Can we take teams of remote viewers uh, and ask them to map out for us the uh, realms of consciousness, continents of consciousness that uh, could be explored, things relating to how uh, reincarnation operates, for example, things relating to different planes of existence, such as the uh, well uh, often discussed and written about the astral plane, the higher and the lower astral plane, and other planes of consciousness. Um, Different systems describe them in different ways, but we could, we'd have rough maps for sure. We could begin to create precise maps. So, in addition to spirit mediums and remote viewers, we also have evidence that this realm is accessible to advanced meditators. And now I'm referring to the research of William Van Gordon as reported on this channel in in which he's shown that advanced Buddhist meditators are capable of entering into uh, a realm very, very comparable to that reported by near-death experiencers. Oh, and near-death experiencers, also another category. You might say, how can you research near-death experience? Well, the truth of the matter is that uh, Pim von Lommel has done exactly that, as reported on this channel. You might think you never know when somebody's going to have a near-death experience. They're usually quite spontaneous and unpredictable. But von Lommel has shown that actually in the cardiac units of various hospitals when people experience cardiac arrest, 
Many of them are clinically dead, but then are revived. And he found he was able to do research on that population. It's a considerable population. So that's another category of experiencers. Uh, still, these people aren't highly trained and we only get to them after the fact, not before the fact. So, um, I wouldn't place near-death experiencers as high on the list as, for example, people who train themselves consciously to enter into states of lucid dreaming. That's another category. So, in effect, we can be sending psychonauts into inner space just as we have sent astronauts into outer space. I think it would be a very exciting project. That's where I'd put my money. Now, let me ask you. I'm interested in what viewers have to say. Suppose you had a few million dollars to research in some area associated with consciousness. Where would you invest that money? Thank you for being with me.